Good morning. Welcome to worship. Are there any announcements this morning? We will be having a consistory meeting right here following the service. Oh, the activity room? Okay, over there. We'll have it there. Following this service today. And we, we thank God for this time together. We pray that the grace of God will heal your hurts, that the strength of God will give you courage to face the work before you, and that the peace of God will keep you secure, safe, and steady in Christ Jesus. Let us worship together as we join in singing our first hymn, Jesus Shall Reign. Let us join in our responsive call to worship. Life can sometimes be very difficult. In the midst of our trials and tribulations, God is with us. Come, let us praise God for God's abiding presence. And so I ask you, members of Grace Lower Stone Church, what do you believe in? Let us join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now our music ministry is from a recording of prior choirs here at the church. And now at this time, we have a children's message. If our children could come up front here, Sandra's prepared a message for you. So, do you know who I am? No. Do you know who he is? Okay. And what's your name? Okay. And your name? Okay. And what's his name? Okay. Well, in the Bible, um, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he said, who do people think that, who do they say that I am? Well, they weren't sure. They said John the Baptist, maybe, or Ezekiel. Uh, you know, they throw out names. and But he was none of those. 
And he looked at his disciples and said, who do you say that I am? And all of them were quiet except for Peter who spoke up. And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the true son of God. Okay? So now we know that Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus said, well, thank you, Peter. Well, his name, his name was actually Simon. And so he changed Simon's name to Peter because Peter means the rock. So you say, okay, what does that have to do with all of this? Well, a rock is firm, right? It doesn't move on its own. If it's a big rock, you can't move it. A lot of times tractors can't move them. They have to call in bigger equipment, right? Well, this makes a foundation. This makes this church is built on rock. We know we have rock on the outside of the building. We have rock under the building. The rock symbolizes that he would be the one, that Peter was the one that heard directly from heaven, and so he knew who Jesus was. So he called Peter the rock. Now, other places in the Bible, you'll hear, hear other people called the rock. There's one that says Christ is, that Jesus is the rock. So the rock means just a solid foundation. They're unshakable, they're unmovable. And his belief in, that Jesus Christ was the true Messiah, that was what was unshakable. And then he told his disciples... Do not go tell anyone that I am the Messiah. Do you know why he told him that? What happened to what happened to Jesus when he got older? Mm -hmm. He they hung him on the cross, right? He hung on the cross, he died. And he rose in three days. So he is Christianity. That's where the name Christ is Christianity. And Peter was the one to start that had the first belief in what Christianity really was. This was a hard lesson for me to do. Okay, can you tell that? All right. Any questions? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful, cool day that you've given us today. We pray that you be with each and every one of these children and all of the other participants as we go throughout the day that you will keep us in your loving care. Lord, we open our hearts and minds to the people that are in need of prayer right now, and we just pray, Lord, that you be with them. Now bless these children, and thank you your son Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, children. Thank you, Sandra. I thought for a moment you might have rock candy. Remember rock candy? <laughs> Hard to find nowadays. <laughs> well, that's great. <coughs>
this point, we come to our pastoral prayer. Are there any names we need to lift up today, especially in prayer? as well so let us take these names and others join our hearts and minds in a time of prayer to the Lord let us pray Father God we come before you praising you for you are the great creator sustainer of all things you are all righteous all holy all powerful and all loving and we thank you that in Jesus Christ we can come before you because his shed blood has cleansed us from all sins and you hear our prayers in his name. Father God, we thank you that you care for us and invited us to cast our cares upon you. And so we lift up these whom we've named and others that we name silently in our hearts at this time. We pray that you would heal them, encourage them, give them strength and sustenance and comfort and be with their families. May they know your surrounding presence and that you will never leave them or forsake them no matter what they experience or are going through. And we pray, O oh Lord, for others who might be anxious or depressed or worried, that you would bring your peace that passes all understanding to guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We pray for those who are going through this pandemic that you would heal them and we give you thanks for those that you have in our healing, returning to wholeness. We pray for doctors, nurses, CNAs, others who are treating these patients that they would not be overwhelmed but sustain them and strengthen them too. Lord, we pray this morning for those who are in the lines of the fires in California. Pray that you would give them safety and protect them. And we pray for the firefighters and the first responders, that they would be strengthened, that they would not be overwhelmed. We thank you for them and ask for your protection upon them. Lord, we pray for those who are in the paths of these two hurricanes coming this week. Pray that they might find higher ground and safety and that you would protect them as well and that people would have the resources they need to sustain them. And Lord, as we pray for all these physical dangers and powerful material manifestations, we pray, Lord, for spiritual truths that people would turn to you even more encouragingly and find rest for their souls in Jesus Christ. May they see these times that we are in as a time to set their priorities aright and straight and to lift you high and to lift up their own minds and thoughts to the heavens and not always on this earth. And may those who do not know you be led by the Holy Spirit to receive Christ today and this week as their Lord and Savior, you might bring them into your kingdom, preparing subjects for your rule. Lord, we thank you for your word, which will never pass away, and it is a sure rock and a guide for us, a light under our feet, a lamp under our paths. We thank you, Lord, for its promises. And we know that all its promises and your promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those in authority, the president, vice president, governor, mayors, others, for we know that there is none in authority except those whom you have placed there, Lord. And we pray that they would be guided by your spirit to seek peace and quiet that we might live in all godliness and holiness and that all people 
would come to a knowledge of the truth and salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we can gather in freedom today and to worship you as you have told us to worship in your word. And we pray for other churches that they would be strengthened by your Holy Spirit and used by you even and especially in this time of trial and crises to bring the news and the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom that others may be gathered in to your praise and glory. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer from our hearts today, and we also pray now that you would hear our voices as we join together in praying the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is found in the book of Psalms today. And we are reading from Psalm 138. And in this Psalm we see a special note about God's word in verse two, where he says, you have magnified your word above all your name. We give thanks for God's word, the rock upon which we stand. Hear God's word from Psalm 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me, your mercy, O oh Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join in singing the good old hymn, Blessed Assurance.
Our gospel reading comes from Matthew as we continue in this book. And it is the story of Peter's confession of who Jesus is. Also, it's the first time we see the word church get mentioned in the New Testament. So hear God's holy word. And before we do, let us pray. Father God, we do thank you for your word and we pray that you would silence any voice in our hearts and minds at this time, that we would hear your voice speaking to us through your word by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear God's holy word beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. May the Lord bless reading understanding of his holy word. Let us bow in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the passage that we heard today where Peter acknowledges Jesus as Messiah. Now, what is a Messiah? And we use that term sometimes rather loosely. And we think a lot of times it may mean Savior. But Messiah doesn't mean Savior. We're going to look at this today and see what the term Messiah means and how that influences our own lives of faith. And also, we mentioned that this is the first time we see the word church mentioned. And we're going to see a little change in Jesus' emphasis of his preaching after this. So first, what is Messiah? Well, Messiah simply means the anointed one, the anointed one of God. And it is, means a king. And you remember David was king. And when he was chosen by God, he, God sent Samuel to pick David and then he anointed him with oil and he poured oil on his head and that was a symbol that God had chosen him and the spirit was with him and he was the anointed one. And Messiah is the anointed one, king in Hebrew, and Christ 
is Messiah in Greek. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title that relates to the kingdom. And we need to look at this term Messiah. How is it implied and lived out in our lives today? Can we with Peter even today declare to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God? He is king, and he is king of kings. And if you have your Bibles, I would ask that you turn to Psalm again, because Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm which declares God's understanding of who the Messiah is, who he is to be, and his name here within this psalm. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. There's that term. Saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So the anointed one is the king. He set him on the hill of Zion, which is Jerusalem. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Here we see reflected Peter's confession. You are the son of God. He was named him, named here by God. You are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So here we see Messiah is a very special king. He is anointed of God. He is declared to be the son of God. And not only will he rule over Jerusalem and that kingdom as David did, but he will rule over all the nations, all the nations of the world. And people will stream to Jerusalem to hear the Messiah and his teaching. So the Messiah actually had three functions which he was going to perform. He was going to be king of Israel and defeat the enemies of Israel, ruling from Jerusalem. He was to unite the people, bringing all the Jewish people home to their country. They had been in dispersion. He would reunite them. And thirdly, and perhaps most uniquely, he was to be a great teacher of the Torah, five books of the Old Testament. He would know them. He would proclaim them. He would give understanding to the people. And all the nations would come to Jerusalem to learn about God's word and his holy word and learn how to live to glorify God. The other thing to emphasize is that it does mean king. Now, when Jesus was living in Israel and Palestine at that time, it was being ruled by whom? What country? Rome, correct? And Rome was ruled by their own king called Caesar. And they did not cotton to any other person being a king. And this is why Jesus said in today's scripture at the end, don't tell people that I'm Christ Messiah. Why? Because it would get him into trouble before he had time to proclaim and to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And so he said, don't get that out there. But in fact, it did bring him trouble, did it not? And the people and the authorities crucified him. And in fact, on the cross, what was the sign over the cross? Here is Jesus, King of the Jews. And uh, he didn't deny it when Pilate said, you are King of the Jews, so you say. He is King of the Jews. Now, in his preaching... Jesus didn't really describe a lot about this kingdom that he was to be king over because 
he came preaching to the Jewish people, they would understand from all the prophets in the Old Testament what this kingdom was. They understood a Messiah who would be anointed by God, is going to be ruling, who would be bringing all his people home to Israel. They understood that. So we don't see a lot of detail that Jesus goes into about this kingdom and the coming kingdom. People knew what it was, and they knew what the Messiah was. So Messiah, an anointed one of God, he's going to rule from Jerusalem, bring his people home, rule over all the world. But secondly, the people wanted Jesus to be that Messiah. He came and he was performing these wonderful miracles. He was raising the dead and people could see a great prophet now, no one said he is God at this time. They said he's a great prophet. We believe he would be king, the man who would be king. Did prophets perform miracles? Yeah, you remember Elisha? He raised the dead widow's son. He fed the hundred prophets, 20 loaves of bread. Here's Jesus, a greater prophet than Elisha or Elijah. And the people wanted to make him their king, so he could cast out these Roman rulers and restore the pure worship in the temple and bring all the Jewish people who had been dispersed around the world home to their land. But it wasn't his time. You remember the story where he fed the 5,000 people? Well, 5,000 men, probably 10 or 15,000 people after that miracle it says that Jesus knew and felt and was determined that the people were going to make him king by force and so he withdrew himself and went to a mountain to pray all night he knew that they wanted a king and he knew that they were going to try to force him to become king at that time he said no it's not my time yet. What is the other place where they really welcomed him as king in the New Testament? Well, Palm Sunday. Here he is entering Jerusalem. The people are putting palm fronds down in front of the donkey as he's coming in. That putting palm fronds down is a reminder of when Judas Maccabeus Enter Jerusalem and recaptured it from the Greeks. They welcomed him in that way as a king. And they were welcoming Jesus as the king Messiah anointed who would take over and get rid of the Romans and become the king here. But it wasn't his time. It was not to be. He came offering the kingdom to the Jewish nation, but they rejected him. The leaders rejected him. And he had said at the beginning of his ministry, repent for the kingdom is nigh, it is near. I'm offering it to you as the Jewish people to, to fulfill the covenant promises. But they rejected him. And so we see a change in his preaching. After this, Jesus would no more preach that the kingdom is nigh, he would preach there must be a postponement before the coming of the kingdom with Messiah ruling in Jerusalem over all the nations. He said the time is now. There's going to be a time later on. Now he emphasizes the church. And we see the emphasis with this ecclesia, which means church, gathering, a symbol. And it is a time to extend the welcome of God's rule and salvation beyond just the Jewish nation to all the Gentiles. And so he proclaimed the good news to the Gentiles as well. They can come in to this coming kingdom. And now he would proclaim that there are certain things that had to happen now before the kingdom comes. You remember his disciples were sitting outside the temple looking at the temple and they say, Jesus, look at all these wonderful, mighty buildings. And what did Jesus say? There's coming a time when not one of these stones will be left on top of the other. They're all going to be 
thrown down. And they say, what? Tell us about this time. He says, well, there's going to be there's going to be wars and rumors of war. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be double hurricanes. No, he didn't say that. But there's going to be things coming like this. And he says, when you see all these things coming about, know then that the kingdom is nigh. You see that? Then the kingdom is nigh. There's going to be these horrible things coming. And there's going to be tribulation as such that the world would never know and that even the elect would be deceived unless he came again. And so he's opening this understanding of the kingdom and when the Messiah is going to come, the anointed one, to this future time. And now he's saying even the Gentiles can come in. They'll be prepared for this kingdom when it comes and when I return, the Messiah. And so the church is born after the resurrection. Remember on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, pours out on these disciples. And they have marvelous gifts of healing and prophecy. And in fact, Peter says, you know, this was proclaimed and prophesied by Joel, you remember. At the end times, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, all men and maidens, and they will prophesy. Well, was the spirit poured out on all people? Was it the end times? No. But it was a sign of the end times that's coming. And when Christ returns, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit, as John prophesied. Even all creation will be renewed by the Spirit, the same Spirit that resurrected Christ, and we will be resurrected. We will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and the works that Jesus did, we will even do greater in this millennial kingdom that's coming. So you have the Holy Spirit when you believe in Christ. It's a channel for Christ to live in you by faith in your heart. But it's also an earnest. What do I mean? Have you ever made an earnest payment on a house? You know, it's your pledge that you will buy this house. It's for sure. Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is an earnest to you and to me that we will be glorified one day by the coming of the Lord. Don't give up hope. It's going to happen. And so now Christ is able to live in us by the Holy Spirit. And we know when he returns, all things will be made new then. And all the nations will worship at Christ's feet, proclaim him Lord and Savior. So we have been given this earnest to prepare us. And Peter proclaimed that at the coming of Pentecost. And also... Jesus says, you know, Peter, you're going to be the rock, like Sandra showed us today. You're going to be the rock. Well, was it just Peter, the person who's the rock, or was it really his confession that Jesus is the Son of God, Messiah? That's the rock upon which the church is founded. But Peter himself will go on, and he will proclaim this salvation in the kingdom to the Gentiles in Acts 10. You remember when Cornelius came and he brought his Gentile friends and they heard the gospel and they began speaking in tongues and Peter said, well, we can baptize them. They've, they've received the gospel now. And he says, before this, we weren't even allowed to go into a Gentile's home. And now it's opening up. Peter was used of God. And then later on, there, there came a question. You remember, well, can Gentiles really come in and be a part of us if they're not going to be circumcised, if they're not going to follow all the rules of the Torah? And Peter said, why put a burden, a yoke on them that we don't even keep perfectly? No, he said, here's the thing. You know, there's a couple of things. They, they don't have to become Jews to be saved. That was a new understanding. He said, just be sure they don't eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. They don't eat meat with blood in it. Well, these were things uh, that the Jews knew were important from the Old Testament. So he said, if Gentiles keep those things, 
then Jews and Gentiles can live together in peace in the church until Christ returns. And so Peter was used by God to open up the understanding of his kingdom and what it means to be preparing. And we're in this church time now as we are gathering in or the Lord is gathering in the full number of Gentiles before he returns. We say, why doesn't Christ return now? You know, things are getting pretty bad. And we pray, Maranatha, come, Lord, return. Well, it's because he wants more people to be saved. He wants that full number of Gentiles to be prepared for this kingdom that he's going to bring in. You see, the Lord doesn't want anyone uh, to die without salvation. He wants all to come to knowledge of the truth in Jesus Christ. So he's giving this time for the church to witness to it. And then he will bring in the kingdom that has been postponed. We have the earnest of the Holy Spirit. We're waiting for that. And we think of that now, even as we see all this bad news around us. We've got to focus on the kingdom that's coming, on how the Holy Spirit's in us now and that Christ lives in it. It's no longer you that live. You've been crucified with Christ through faith. and It's Christ that lives in you. Now, and the, and the life you live in the flesh, you live by the faith of Jesus Christ until he returns and baptizes all, makes a new creation, new bodies. We're waiting for that. That's hopeful. So I want to end with a metaphor of the garden. You know, we started out in the Bible in a garden. Everything was wonderful, wasn't it? Adam and Eve could have lived forever eating of the tree of life. It was a wonderful place, but sin ruined it. But we're waiting for a return of the garden, for paradise that's coming back when Christ returns and renews all things. And it's the same way in our own minds and in our thoughts. You know, a garden has to be cultivated, doesn't it? Just not run wild. You have to plant what you want to grow and you have to water it and fertilize it. Then you have to pull up those plants that you don't want growing and it's very orderly and it's beautiful. Well, that's the way it is with our own minds and our thoughts. We can't just let any thought take root in our minds and grow and, and push out the beautiful thoughts that we have. And the Holy Spirit gave us understanding of this through Paul in the book of Philippians. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to Philippians 4. Many of you already know this uh, verse. But in it, uh, the Holy Spirit's reminding us how to cultivate the thoughts in our minds in, in this interim period as we're waiting for Christ's return and bring in his kingdom. In verse 8 of Philippians 4, you remember, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And so I encourage you to meditate on these things I've expounded from Scripture today. This is truth. It is pure. It is lovely that Christ is going to return and set up his kingdom here. And in the meantime, we are to plant these thoughts and remember them and meditate on the good news that we've been given. And then as we cultivate the gardens of our minds, you will be prepared to live in hope in whatever period of crisis you're going through. And living in that hope, you will be empowered to help others who have no hope. You will be able and prepared to do the good works of love which God prepared for you before the foundation of the world. And so as I close, remember to keep your thoughts on the good news of the kingdom of God that's coming. Keep your thoughts 
on that Christ lives in you now by faith, empowering in you in your daily walk. And let us give thanks always and only to God in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and Messiah. Let us bow in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for the hope you've given us and for the truth. Help us to fill our minds and thoughts with this truth. It is worthy and it is noble and it is lovely. And then use us and send us out to bring hope to others in the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Let us now sing together our closing hymn, uh, which is Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. Now go out into the world in peace, have courage, holding on to what is good, returning no one evil for evil. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.